So let's move to the second speaker of this afternoon. I'm honored to introduce Adele Reinhardt. Uh, she is professor at the University of Ottawa. She has been a member of the Institute of Advanced Studies in Princeton and Jerusalem, and a visiting professor at Harvard Divinity School, Yale Divinity School, and Boston College. She was the general editor of the Journal of, the Biblical, uh, of Biblical Literature until uh, 2018, and has been appointed as the next director of the SBL Society of Biblical Literature. Her, uh, her main areas of research are New Testament, feminist biblical criticism, early Jewish Christian relations, and the Bible and film. Today, uh, she will talk us about uh, the Pharisees on film. Okay, thank you very much, and it's a pleasure to be here. I want to thank uh, Joseph Sievers for the invitation, which I appreciated very much, and a special thanks to the technological set up and the people who are involved with that. Uh, those of us that work with film and that try to do lectures with film know about the high uh, glitch rate in, uh, in uh, showing clips, and so I very much appreciated the assistance of the people here. And now after Christian's talk, I want to change the whole introduction to my paper, uh, which I, I think I will do. And just to mention only that the uh, film tradition of the Jesus movies, the first Jesus movie was in the early 20th century, uh, or actually in the late 19th century, 1890s. And it comes from the, Ober, the Passion Play tradition, especially the Oberammergau tradition that was so influential. And so uh, the order in which we are in this program is also the order of development of, of these uh, dramatic ways of presenting Jesus' story. What I'm going to talk about today uh, are uh, three films in which the Pharisees play a certain role. And my main focus here, it was very hard to choose because the Pharisees are in almost all of the Jesus movies to a greater or lesser extent. Uh, in uh, all cases, they're presented as Jesus' enemies. And of course, the main trope is the trope of hypocrisy taken from Matthew 23. So what I want to uh, talk about today are three films. Uh, 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 the first one, let's see if this will work now. Yeah, the first one is D.W. Griffith, uh, Intolerance from 1916, which is a classic film in, in uh, film history. The second is the 1964 film um, by uh, Pier Paolo Pasolini, The Gospel According to St. Matthew, um, which many people and many critics consider to be the best Jesus movie that has been made. Uh, and the third is my personal favorite, Jesus of Montreal, of course, Canadian, 1989, uh, directed by Denis R. Arcand. And what I'm looking at, these three films represent three eras in the Jesus film genre. And they also represent three different ways of portraying the theme of hypocrisy in connection with the uh, Pharisees. And of course, underlying the discussion is the connection between the hypocrisy charge and anti-Semitism. And my study of these movies, um, just like my study in the Gospel of John, is ultimately focused on this issue of the ways in which certain texts and certain dramatic representations of those texts have contributed to anti-Semitism and also how that can be changed. We'll see an example of that. So we begin with D.W. Griffith. This is a silent movie, uh, an epic film, Intolerance, 1916. Intolerance is not uh, really a Jesus movie as such, or at least it is much more than a Jesus movie. Intolerance weaves together four different stories set in four different time periods in order to illustrate the theme of uh, the, the triumph of love over intolerance. Now there's a section of that film which is called the Judean story 
and uh, it is the shortest of all of the sections. This is a film that takes more than three and a half hours, and the Judean section is 12 minutes. Originally, it was much, much longer, and then um, Griffith uh, consulted a number of uh, Jewish advisors and cut out almost all the passion scenes and a whole bunch of other stuff, but in order to um, uh, respond to the charges of anti-Semitism. But we'll see that he still left in a few choice uh, bits. Now, despite its brevity, the Judean story focuses, as I mentioned, like the entire film, on the contrast between love and intolerance. Naturally, Jesus represents love, and the Pharisees represent intolerance. The theme of hypocrisy is front and center from the very first appearance of the, uh, of the Pharisees. Um, and we see, actually here, this is the intertitle that accompanies the first viewing of the Pharisees, and we have a definition, certain hypocrites among the Pharisees. Uh, sorry, uh, yeah, and then the definition, Pharisee, a learned Jewish party, the name possibly brought into disrepute by hypocrites among them. And you can hear the careful wording, surely shaped by the rabbi that Griffith uh, uh, consulted. And interestingly enough, after Craig's talk, it's not an etymological <laughs> definition. Matthew 23 is clearly in the background here, although the intertitle takes pains to assert that not all Pharisees are hypocrites. Now this is a point that disappears under the weight of the later segments of this uh, portion of the film. The next appearance of the Pharisees shows men dressed in traditional fashion, heads covered, and you'll see that whenever they're on the screen, they're wearing tefillin and a prayer shawl draped over their heads, even though I'm sure not even in the first century did uh, Jews you know, wander around the streets and the marketplace and so on wearing their tefillin. So uh, one of them prays publicly and ostentatiously, O oh Lord, I thank thee that I am better than other men. And here too, there is some unstated background. The most direct gospel source is Luke 18, 11, a passage that we've looked at already this week. This is a parable in which a self-righteous Pharisee thanks God for not making him like other people thieves, rogues, adulterers, or tax collectors. The visual portrayal of the Pharisee, however, recalls not so much the Lucan parable, but Jewish liturgy. And this uh, allusion here, as you can see, uh, is carried by the fact that he's wearing tefillin. We'll go back to the earlier one, actually, here. Uh, oh, yeah, there. That he's wearing tefillin, which are worn only during the weekday morning prayers. These prayers thank God for opening the eyes of the blind. So this is in Jewish liturgy, still said uh, every morning. Uh, so the thanks to God for opening the eyes of the blind, clothing the naked, freeing the captives, and providing for all sorts of human needs. And also included in these morning prayers are blessings in which the worshiper thanks God for not making him a Gentile, a slave, or a woman. And I think that is the background to this uh, to this uh, particular scene. It is perhaps natural to conclude that a man who is thankful that he is Jewish, free, born, and male, or not a thief, a rogue, adulterer, views himself as better than other men. But this conclusion does not at all capture the sense and the essence of the prayer from a Jewish perspective. The Pharisees in Griffith's movie are not only self-righteous hypocrites, but also party poopers because they are opposed to social drinking. And here we have, these are the two here. They are lurking outside the hall in Cana where the wedding is taking place and Jesus is inside drinking wine. And this is what Griffith wants to show, that Jesus happily uh, partook of, of wine and these uh, horrible Pharisees uh, are against it. And so they comment to each other, uh, they were meddlers then and now. There is too much revelry and pleasure-seeking among the people. 
These and the other segments of the Judean story reduce the gospel to a conflict between a loving Jesus and hypocritical Pharisees. It reduces that conflict to one over pleasure and revelry and reduces Jesus to a man devoted to wine and pleasure. But there is more. For Griffith, the triumph of love over intolerance has two specific reference. One is social and one is personal. The social context is the American era of prohibition, which Griffith vehemently opposed. In fact, most of this entire film is a diatribe against prohibition. In the context of this film, the Pharisees actually represent the temperance movement, which in Griffith's view killed pleasure by opposing alcohol. On the personal level, at the time that he was making this film, Griffith was still smarting from the harsh criticism he had received over his earlier film that came out in, in 1915, The Birth of the Nation. This is the poster for that, The Birth of a Nation. The Birth of a Nation celebrates the Ku Klux Klan, uh, portrays American, African Americans as sexual predators, and uses white actors in blackface. Not surprisingly, the film was condemned as racist, a charge that Griffith resented very much. And so he made the film Intolerance as a protest against those who had criticized him for the earlier film. Griffith's championing of love over intolerance seems highly ironic, given that his own films exemplify intolerance more than love. But both cinema and politics are full of such ironies. From the early 20th century Hollywood, we now move to southern Italy of the mid-1960s and Pasolini's film, The Gospel According to St. Matthew. As the film's name implies, the storyline and the dialogue are taken exclusively from the first gospel, although some scenes are omitted uh, and, or rearranged. Interestingly, the visuals sometimes tell a different story from the dialogue and this, as we shall soon see, is the case with Pasolini's portrayal of the Pharisees. So here's Jesus. Whoops, there was Jesus. Uh, so Jesus, the disciples, their followers, these are all, uh, they are all depicted as rural, impoverished Italians of Pasolini's own era. They wear robes to kind of evoke uh, the ancient world, but they all have uh, bare heads and short hair, which is not the case in other Jesus movies. The Romans also look more or less modern. They wear hard hats and armor, more or less like Italian soldiers during World War II. The Jewish authorities, in contrast, wear elaborate headgear that clashes visibly with the contemporary head, uh, hairstyles. And here is a group of Pharisees, Sadducees, and priests that we can see from the back. And uh, here we have uh, a Pharisee on the left, and I mean a Sadducee on the left and a Pharisee on the right. The Pharisees' unusual headgear is actually modeled on uh, Pier della Francesca's frescoes, The Legends of the True Cross. And that's what we have here. And incidentally, resembles the headgear used not for a Pharisee, but for Caiaphas the high priest in the 2010 production of the Oberammergau Passion Play. We've just seen uh, many, many um, slides of that. As in the other Jesus movies, the Pharisees play a prominent role as Jesus' hypocritical opponents. But Pasolini's movie is unique, completely unique among all of the Jesus movies in that it includes the full text of Matthew 23. This uh, scene occupies almost seven minutes, so we're not going to see the whole thing. Seven minutes is an eternity in cinematic terms. As in Matthew, the key phrase, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, is repeated passionately and emphatically, louder and louder and louder each time. So here we'll see uh, just a few segments uh, in this one, uh, we see that he begins calmly enough, but this is the very beginning of the speech. Sulla cattedra dei Mosei si sono insegnati gli scribi e i farisei. Fate dunque e osservate tutte le cose che vi dicono, ma non imitate le loro opere, perché dicono e non fanno. 
But a minute or so into the speech, we see the Romans marching up. And they are the ones on the screen as Jesus voices the next accusation of hypocrisy. La cattedra dei Mosei si sono insegnati gli scrivi. Whoops. Let's play this. Okay, so what I wanted to show there was just at the moment that we see on the screen, woe to you, scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites, it's the Romans that we see, the Roman soldiers that we see, and there is no Pharisee in sight here. In the next uh, part of this long clip, a riot breaks out and the Roman police put a stop to it. So here we hear Jesus almost spitting out the word Pharisees numerous times through the entire scene, drawing our attention to their vile hypocrisy. But striking is the complete visual absence of the Pharisees or other Jewish figures, Jewish leadership figures, during the entire sermon. Only the Roman soldiers appear, apparently concerned to maintain law and order in a vicious ways. So here the visuals are in stark contrast to the explicit content of Matthew's dialogue. So on the one hand, we might say, uh, we might view this detail as a sign of Pasolini's intent in the film. Pasolini was not particularly interested in historical facts about the conflict between Jesus and various groups nor did he draw a straight line from first century Jewish leaders to the Jews of his own day, at least not explicitly. Rather, his stated goal was to draw an analogy between first century Palestine and the conflict in post-war Italy between the authoritarian political and religious leadership and the popu uh, everyday population. The visual absence of the Pharisees at this critical juncture might be intended to draw our attention away from the historical or literary context of Matthew 23 and towards the political and social context of Italy in the 1960s. Pasolini says that he deliberately did not consult scholars for his gospel according to St. Matthew because he wasn't interested in history. His purpose was not to reconstruct Jesus as he really was, but to reconsecrate him or to remythicize him. But this allegorical intent may not be at all apparent to viewers unfamiliar with the situation in 1960s Italy. Outside of that context, the visual absence of the Pharisees only serves to accentuate their oral presence as he repeats this over and over again, louder and louder each time, especially due to his, the loud and angry voice and then the escalating music as well. So it may well be that Pasolini was more concerned with the allegorical dimensions of his Jesus movies than the historical or ethical ones. But it is hard, for me at least as a Jewish viewer, to ignore the whiff of anti-Semitism in his portrayal of the Pharisees. And the same can be discerned in his personal remarks about Jews and about Israel. In a 1968 interview, 
Pasolini refers to the Jewish tendency towards masochism and self-exclusion. So he called this sad but admirable. But, he says, he deplores their newfound normalcy as a majority in the state of Israel. This normalcy, he said, is very hard to swallow. Today is Yom HaAtzma'ut, of course, so uh, one thinks about such, uh, such remarks. Pasolini's ambivalence towards Jews comes to the fore in his version of the trial before Pilate. Matthew's gospel does not specify that the Pharisees were present at the trial. He refers directly to chief priests and elders. Nevertheless, Pasolini inserts Pharisees, as we see from their headgear. So we're going to see now just a small section of, that, of the trial narrative, which is in, uh, from Matthew 27, in which, Jesus fought, uh, in, in which Pilate washes his hands of all responsibility for uh, Jesus' death. From a cinematic perspective, this is a gorgeous scene. It's, mute, it's moving and beautifully staged. And the camera work, it's a handheld camera. It places us as viewers towards the back of the crowd of Jesus supporters as Pilate declares his innocence and a single unidentified voice shouts the infamous line, let, let his blood be on our children. Despite their different hats, the Jewish leaders are portrayed mono, monolithically as a raid against Jesus. Now, I appreciate the allegorical point that Pasolini is trying to make here. This is signaled by the costuming of the Roman soldiers, the use of local non-professional actors, and the obviously Italian setting. I just wish that he had not used the Pharisees and the Jews more generally to stand in for the corrupt religious and political authorities that he is critiquing from his own time and place. A rather different approach is taken in Denis Arcand's 1989 movie, Jesus of Montreal. As I mentioned at the outset, this is my personal favorite among the Jesus movies, and not just because I am Canadian. Like Pasolini's film, Arcand's film is allegorical. It uses the Jesus story as a way to critique contemporary society, in this case, very specifically, um, Quebec society in the 1980s. Unlike Pasolini's film, however, Arcan is careful to avoid any trace of anti-Judaism or anti-Semitism. These efforts are apparent in the brief references to and treatment of the Pharisees, as we will see in a moment. As the title implies, Arcan's film is set in modern-day Montreal. It features a small troupe of underemployed actors who are hired by the priest of St. Joseph's Oratory on Mount Royal, perhaps some of you have been there, uh, to revamp the annual Passion Play that's presented outside in the vicinity of the oratory um, every year uh, around Easter time. What these actors come up with is a powerful new play that presents a Jesus so vital and compelling that some members of the audience think that this is actually Jesus. In the course of writing, rehearsing, and finally performing the play, Danielle Coulomb, the actor within the film who plays the Jesus of the Passion Play gradually takes on a Christ-like persona 
that has a powerful impact on all those around him. So the film itself, if you haven't seen it, there's a frame narrative within contemporary Montreal, and we see the passion play itself within that frame narrative, the passion play that these actors create. The Pharisees as such are absent from both the passion play and the frame narrative, so there aren't any Pharisees here. But there are references to the Pharisees, one explicit and one implicit within the passion play, and these are, we'll focus on these uh, scenes. The explicit reference is to the slaughter of 800 Pharisees, oh, forgot to show you the oratory, here we go, um, uh, by King Alexander some 80 years before Jesus' time. And this is based on this passage in Josephus' uh, Antiquities, uh, Book 13, that refers to 800 of them being uh, crucified and uh, the throats of their children and wives were cut before their eyes. Not very nice. And this is mentioned, this incident is mentioned in the Passion Play. Le roi de Judée avait crucifié 800 pharisiens après la révolte des esclaves menée par Spartacus. 7000 hommes furent crucifiés le long de la voie Appienne entre Rome et Capou. Okay, that's really the only direct reference to the Pharisees in the whole, in the whole thing. And the point is to uh, show that Jesus' crucifixion was not a unique event, that it was a common form of execution in the ancient world, in the Roman world. And it's intended to then uh, counteract the stereotypical presentation of the Pharisees as power-hungry and violent enemies of Jesus by showing that they, in turn, were uh, victims. The implicit reference to the Pharisees occurs in the Passion Play's reinterpretation of Matthew 23. On vous a dit, tu ne te parjureras pas. Or, moi, je vous dis de ne pas jurer du tout. Que votre parole soit oui, si c'est oui. Non, si c'est non. Tout ce qui est rajouté relève du mauvais. Malheur à vous, les législateurs, parce que vous chargez le peuple de fardeaux impossibles à porter. Et vous-même, vous ne touchez à ces fardeaux d'un seul de vos doigts. Mais fiez-vous des prêtres qui se plaisent à circuler en longue robe, à recevoir des salutations sur les places publiques, à occuper les premiers rangs dans les temples et les premiers fauteuils dans les banquets, qui dévorent les héritages des veuves et affectent de longues prières. Ils subiront cela, une condamnation plus sévère. Celui qui voudra devenir grand parmi vous devra être votre serviteur. Celui qui voudra être le premier parmi vous devra être l'esclave de tous. Ne vous faites jamais appeler rabbin ou mon révérend père, ou mon seigneur ou éminence, car vous n'avez qu'un maître qui est dans les cieux et vous êtes tous frères. À la fin de sa vie, Ils étaient très nombreux et très puissants, tous ceux qui avaient hâte de le voir crucifié. So I think you get the point here. The sermon, Matthew 23, here clearly, I mean, Jesus' sermon here clearly draws an analogy between the Pharisees of Matthew's gospel and the Catholic Church in Quebec. But our con goes beyond mere substitution to take a deliberate stance against Christian anti-Semitism. The Passion Play and the frame narrative collide at the end of the final performance of the Passion Play on the grounds of St. Joseph's oratory, uh, oratory. During a melee between the audience and the security guards, the cross that Jesus is hanging on topples and it pins the actor's head to the ground. An ambulance rushes Daniel, the actor, to St. Mark's Hospital, which doesn't really exist, where despite being unconscious, he's left in a crowded hallway to wait his turn. Uh, after a while, he seems to recover. He gets up off the bed and walks out of the hospital, but then he collapses again on the subway platform. And this time, he is rushed to the Montreal Jewish General Hospital, which is a real hospital 
in Montreal. So at St. Mark's Hospital, he was in a crowded corridor. Nobody looked at him twice, and the women that were uh, accompanying him were just chased away. And here he's treated with care and compassion. And this is a contrast, intended contrast, between St. Mark's and the Montreal Jewish General, and also linguistically between French-speaking Quebecois Catholic Church-run uh, organizations and Anglophone uh, Jewish organizations. So contributing to the um, obvious attempt to uh, counteract the anti-Semitism of the gospel stories and their representation is the visual detail on the uniform of the nurse and the doctor, which is uh, Megain David. And this is the uniform worn uh, by the workers at the, um, at the Montreal Jewish uh, General Hospital. But it also subtly evokes the Jewish badge worn by the Jewish residents of the ghettos and concentration camps of the Nazi uh, regime. There are no Pharisees in this scene, not even allegorically or symbolically. But because the Pharisees are so often included, as we've just seen with Pasolini, in the cinematic accounts of Jesus' trial and death, their ghosts hover over this very different representation of Jesus' last moments and draws attention to the contrast. So to conclude, the Pharisees on film are a rather one-sided bunch, far more concerned with the troublesome Jesus than the overall corpus of primary and secondary sources would suggest. Indeed, for Griffith and Pasolini and also Arcon, the Pharisees are important only insofar as they permit the conflict inherent in the Jesus story to be translated to the filmmaker's own time and place. Those of us who view the Pharisees not primarily as the hypocritical and sanctimonious uh, opponents to Jesus, but as a complex religious and political group, cannot count on the genre of the Jesus movie to portray the Pharisees as we would like them to be seen. Perhaps some enterprising filmmaker someday will turn his or her attention to the Pharisees as, as a group apart from their putative role in the Jesus story. Until that happens, it is through texts, both primary and secondary, including perhaps material evidence, and not through film, that we will know them best. Thank you very much. Thank you.